My name is Denise Chastain Knight. I'm going to be your host for this web seminar. I am a chemical engineer from Georgia Institute of Technology. I've spent more than 34 years in industry, um, design, process improvements, process safety risk, um, and functional safety. And I've had the opportunity to work with a number of different industries, um, see what we have in common and what we don't. So let's move on to the subject of this webinar. Um, appreciate all of you attending today. What we're going to talk about is um, key to safety instrumented system is the definition of the safe state. We're going to start by defining what we mean by safe state and um, some talk about a little bit about some of the questions about why voting is the way we do it in safety instrumented systems, why it may differ from the logic solver voting. Then we're going to go in and do some examples. We'll look at a sensor voting um, and considerations that we might use to help to decide how we're going to vote our sensors and what our redundancy needs to be. Then we will do several examples looking at some final element um, calculations and see how we might build up the voting and make our vote decisions on what the voting ought to be and how that affects certain parameters in the outcome. And then um, we're also going to talk about using multiple solenoids on a single final element because those are, do happen in industry and we'd like to talk a little bit about. Um, what to consider there, and then we'll um, follow up with a conclusion summary. So moving forward into the definition of a safe state, IEC 61511 defines it as the state of the process where safety is achieved. Whenever we have a safety instrumented function um, trip, when there's a trip that occurs, there are certain activities that need to occur to bring that into a safe condition. And what we're looking for in the verification calculations is sufficient reliability to know that we're achieving that safe state um, within our cell target. Um, we need to consider the physical situation when we are looking at this safe state um, that does impact the voting. And then I find it helpful to always define the safe state in words before we attempt to define the SIP voting. Um, our logic solver is going to be programmed to carry out a number of actions that may include ancillary actions that are not necessarily required to achieve the safe state. They're more about housekeeping and setting the process back into a preferred mode for startup. Those don't have to necessarily be part of the um, calculations for the um, SIL verification um, because the logic solver is going to command all final elements to go to um, the desired state, um, which may or may not reflect the safe state. So this is how the logic is, um, solver is going to be programmed to operate. And sometimes um, we come across folks who, who want to see the SIL verification match exactly the logic solver, and that's really um, not necessary when we're to meet the requirement of the standards. The logic for the safe state will tend to match up to the logic solver programming on the sensor side because this is about the decision to take the action. But on the final element side, it's based on what's necessary to achieve that minimum safe state. So we need to look at the physical arrangement, what redundancy do we have in the process, and we also want to include any ancillary action from that still verification calculation. So that's how we determine our SIF voting, is by looking at this SIF state. So I've got an example process here. Um, this is um, an intermediate reaction. It's kind of simplified here in this diagram. It's an intermediate reaction for the production of nylon six. Um, and our goal here is to stop the reaction on high temperature. We have two streams feeding in the cyclohexanoxime. Um, at the top, and then at the bottom we have sulfuric acid in there. So our initial pass on this, we're going to define the safe state as being just stopping the sulfuric acid feed. We'll be okay with the cyclohex um, and oxime continuing to flow through the process, providing we get the um, H2SO4 um, out of the process so it doesn't continue to react. We have three temperature transmitters in there, but one of the questions we're going to ask is, well, gee, do we really need three temperature transmitters to meet our cell target, or can we do it with um, 
you know, less expensively with only one. So we will look at that in our sensor voting. We also have on our final elements, we have an XPV in that sulfuric acid line. That's an on-off valve that is attached to the cis. And then we have the FPV, um, which is a control valve that is primarily used for um, control in the basic process control system. Um, but we will look a little bit about can that also be used to help support the safety interlock. And for the purpose of this, we are operating in a low demand mode. So with the three temperature sensors, the first thing we're going to look at is what if I only had one and then I decide if we need to use the, the redundancy of three, what is the appropriate voting for that? We'll look primarily at two numbers as we're going through this analysis, the risk reduction factor, which is effectively one over the PFD average. This is the number that we're using to determine have we met our SIL target for random failure. The spurious trip rate, we are confirming that against whatever is set up in our um, safety requirement specification as being the desired spurious trip rate. And um, that information is not specified according to the standard, it is specified according to the owner. Keeping in mind as we go through this, anytime we're doing safety function analysis, we really need to meet the compliance trinity, um, the random failure, which is the PFD average, or we're going to express it in the reciprocal of risk reduction factor today. You have the hardware fault tolerance, that is essentially the architectural redundancy that's required, and that's mandated according to IEC 61511 tables. And then the systematic capability. For the purpose of looking at the voting, the systematic capability doesn't really play into the SIF. It's not influenced by the SIF voting, so we're going to not really talk about systematic capability beyond recognizing that it is one of the three targets we need to meet. So I've gone in here and I've done a set of calculations for us with different voting. These are screen clips showing the results of those calculations. Um, this is in the sensor side looking at it, asking that question, what if we have a one out of one? And then um, if we go with the redundancy, we went ahead and ran the calculations for the one out of three, two out of three, and the three out of three. And the first thing to notice off to the far right is from an architectural perspective, our sensor group meets the SIL2 target, and our target for this SIF is um, risk reduction factor of 120. So we're good on the architectural. We can focus just on the risk reduction factor and then look at how that influences the spurious trip rate. So I've taken these numbers and carried them forward into a table for us to be able to look at and do that analysis. Now, the first thing we do is look at the one out of one, um, and we realize that its risk reduction factor falls below our target. So, um, you know, there's things that we might be able to do to look at the process changing our proof test interval or our emission time, um, other things we might be able, other parameters we might be able to change. But the fact is the one out of one is probably not going to um, be robust enough to meet our risk reduction factor. So maybe we will want to go ahead with the um, redundancy in our temperature transmitters. Um, we'll notice that the one out of one actually delivers a higher risk reduction factor than the three out of three, um, but you'll notice that the three out of three is a much longer spurious trip rate, and that's expressed in years. And typically what we're looking for is the risk reduction factor, the higher the RRF, the higher the reliability, but the higher the mean time to uh, the MTTFS or mean time um, to um, spurious trip is the longer its average, um, the better, the more time there is between trips. So um, as we look at the one out of one and the one out of three, comparing them, um, obviously we the one out of three, we get the highest um, PFH or the highest risk reduction factor but we also get the shortest spurious trip times. So looking at this, um, I'm going to note that a single sensor may be an initial lower cost, but by the time we make any changes to our process in order to attempt to try and reach our target with this, um, we're probably going to end up increasing costs in another place of the life cycle. So it will probably make more sense to move forward and look at the redundant sensor. 
temp or the sen looking at the three sensors in place. Part of asking that um, is we're also, because we've got redundant sensors, um, we may have a sensor fail or we may have to take it offline for doing any kind of proof testing or maintenance. So we need to also look at what's called the degraded voting, um, which is how our voting shifts when we do not have, when we have fewer devices in place than um, the maximum that's installed. So the one out of three and the two out of three, they both are going to degrade to a one out of two voting whenever one of the sensors is unavailable, either due to failure or for maintenance requirements. And the three out of three is going to degrade to a two out of two voting. So we rerun the calculations to look at that degraded voting, and then we come back and add them to our table. And what we notice is that both the one out of three and the two out of three um, meet our risk reduction factor. They both degrade to the voting one out of two, so they continue to meet our risk reduction factor, exceed the target frequency in the sensor group um, during the uh, degraded state. And as we go in and look at our spurious trip rate, the lowest one we have is 197 for the one out of three. And of course, with the two out of three, it is still very um, robust. The three out of three, we actually fail our risk reduction factor on the um, three out of three voting quite badly. So, I mean, it's obviously a bad choice. And then note, it also fails um, to a SIL one when we are in our degraded state but it actually has a better risk reduction factor, interestingly enough. So that redundancy is good, but for the purpose of moving forward, I'm going to go ahead and make the decision that the two out of three really gives me the best balance between having some physical redundancy and um, having something that's resistant to spurious trip states. So it's, it's in good position to pick. So we're going to move forward, look at this a little further, and then use the three out of three. And we're going to start looking at our final element group here. So in this final element group, as I mentioned, we have an XPV that is connected to the safety instrumented system. And then we have a FPV that is primarily controlled by the BPCS. But we're going to want to ask the question, um, well, if I'm using it for the BPCS control, this, you know, if one valve doesn't get me where I want to, can I use this BPCS valve um, also as part of the SIS? So it's not completely independent. There is some redundancy that's involved there because you end up um, using that actuator and valve in both the BPCS control and in the SIS. This is allowed by the standard. It's permitted. Clause 9.4 addresses that. Um, we can do this kind of um, connectivity. It's not necessarily the most desirable approach. We would obviously prefer to have um, full independence between the two, but if we're constrained by um, what we have in our process or we're trying to make um, improvements that can be managed between major outages when you can do major kind of reconfiguration. We can allow this. Um, the assessment does need to consider that independence, the common cause failure when we're doing this. Um, it's not obviously allowed to do it um, qualitative. It must be qualitative, or it may be qualitative, except when we've got CIS-4, in which case that can, needs to be a quantitative assessment. So we can do this um, to look at that common cause, and we'll actually do that here in our first calculation. So I'm going to look at two different calculation modes, um, thought processes. My first, obviously, will be, well, can I maintain that complete independence and have just the um, XPV that is connected to the SIF, the safety instrumented system, do it as a one out of one, as the only valve. If that fails, we're going to want to go back and say, well, okay, if I try and bring this BPCS shared element in, um, once I look at my common cause of failure, what will I um, gain by doing this? So we'll do a one out of two in that second calculation. 
So here's our results of the two calculations, the top one being where we have just the XPV, and then the bottom one is where we share that FPV with the basic process control system. Now this bottom calculation is completely ignoring that common cause failure. We have to actually go offline and find out where we actually land between these two numbers when we take into account that common cause. I did that offline. We will have another webinar on August 12th where I look at um, common cause failure and I'll go into how this calculation was arrived at. But for now, let's just um, look and recognize that when we recognize that common cause failure, because the basic process control valve can fail as it's being used as part of the SIF, or it can fail when it's operating in the basic process control and actually initiate the condition. Um, if it failed full open and took that sulfuric acid to full flow, it could initiate the reaction that we're concerned about um, that this SIF needs to protect against. So that's why it um, is so deeply discounted in, in looking at that common cause failure, why that, that's just about the actuator and the valve that is considered. So having done that, um, yes, we can get some improvement by utilizing that VPCS valve. Um, it um, can theoretically, if we discount the common cause failure, uh, it could take us into the CIL2 range, but when we recognize that we do have that common cause failure, it falls below target. So um, we may have to, if, if we can't go in and do full redundancy, on our safety function, then we may have to look at other provisions in order to get this compliant with that architecture. All right, so having done that, um, we're stepping back, looking at the process, and let's say we decide to revise our definition of safe state. Um, the engineers have stepped back, they've looked at it from a process safety perspective, and they say, you know what, we really need to stop both these feed streams in order to achieve a safe state. So we need to consider both process lines um, and consider the common cause calculation as we go in and do that doing the calculations. So we have two process streams. Um, in each process stream, we're going to call those our subgroups. Um, they're decided based on the physical two different flows. Um, we've got two valves in each of those, so we can do the one out of two voting within the subgroup. And then because we've got two subgroups, then our overall voting between those groups is two out of two. Both of them have to be successful for us to achieve that safe state. And looking at it kind of on a logic um, diagram here, you can see clearly the um, cyclohexanamine um, line and the sulfuric acid line. Each of those have one out of two voting, and then we need both lines to be successful in order to achieve our goal. So I'm going to go on and show you yet another example. This is a little different process where we've got some kind of concentrate and a solvent going into it. Um, again, presuming this is some kind of exothermic reaction um, that we need in order to achieve our safe state here on our final elements, we need to stop the solvent flow, stop the concentrate flow, and open our vent. Now you will notice that the vent is piped just like the solvent feeds where we've got two valves in line, although in this case, both of them are going to the safety instrument and function. As we look at our liquid lines, they're very analogous to what we've looked at before. They would be a one out of two voting. But we get into the vent, our goal there is to open the vent. So our voting here actually has to be two out of two. We have to successfully move both of those valves in order to create a path for flow out to the vent. And then because we've got three subgroups, our voting between groups is three out of three. Um, and I do have that note off to the side that physical arrangement for the vent does have a higher risk of failure because we actually need to be successful in both of those valves in order to achieve our goal. And if you think back to where we looked at the sensor, when you had the um, two out of two or the three out of three, that did end up with a much lower risk reduction factor than having some architectural redundancy there. So 
stating them. Uh, this is basically reiterating what we just showed um, that our feed streams need to be a one out of two, the vent stream has to be a two out of two, and then the overall is a three out of three. And this is again shown graphically. Um, and because we have the one out of two and the concentrate and the solvent streams, we end up with a balance between that redundancy and the, the reliability and the spurious trip rate. But the vent stream is going to be very resistant to spurious trip, but it's going to have a, a lower RRF. So we ask ourselves, is this really the best arrangement um, physically? And come back and say, no, maybe what we need to do on the vent is pipe it in parallel. So these valves are actually now in parallel. We still want to open. Um, we haven't changed anything about our liquids. They are still a one out of two voting structure. But we get into the vent, and that now is a one out of two voting structure. Because if either of those valves open, then we have that clear path to the vent, and we have um, the redundancy in that we have two opportunities to be successful. And our voting between groups is still three out of three. So kind of show that um, on the lookout chart. So you can see that we need to look at our physical consideration and, and understand always physically what it takes to be successful. And that really drives the voting. The final example I have is, is the solenoids. Sometimes people will put more than, you know, typically we have one solenoid um, on any kind of um, XPV or on our valves, our final element valves. But sometimes people will add solenoids either because they think it will add redundancy and re increase the RRF of the situation or because they are concerned about spurious trip rates. And in this example here, we've got um, the same valve. We've got two solenoids in series. But when the SIF trips, the voting on the solenoids will be a two out of two, meaning both of those solenoids have to act in order for the valve to act. This is very, it is um, resistant to spurious trips, but it does have an impact on the risk reduction factor. And then I've also seen it where we have the solenoid valves um, in an ultra, where we've got two solenoid valves in parallel. The thought behind this arrangement is it might improve the reliability of the final valve um, increasing its risk reduction factor. I've gone in and done calculations on these. Um, in this case, we now have a SIL, SIL 1 target with a risk reduction factor of 30 that we're looking for. You'll notice from the architectural state that all of them meet a, a minimum architectural of one SIL 2 cap or SIL capability. One of them you could actually get a SIL-2 capability out of. Um, in our final elements, the one out of one solenoid gives us a risk reduction factor of, of 32. The one out of two solenoids doesn't really bump that risk reduction factor up much. Um, it does shift it a little bit in the final element group, but not significantly. And you can see also in the overall achieved off to the left there that it doesn't move it very much at all. You will also note that by adding the second solenoid, we've actually increased the spurious trip likelihood. So it, the spurious trip would be more frequent than with a one out of one. Um, so then that may not have been what we were trying, may have been um, an undesirable outcome of what we tried to achieve. The um, two out of two solenoid by adding that second solenoid and requiring a two out of two voting, we have actually significantly reduced our risk reduction factor over what a one out of one solenoid would give us. Um, and it is more resistant to spurious trips in that we're now up to 83 years between spurious trips, um, where it was 72 before, but is in the grand scheme of things, is that really a significant improvement um, for what we compromised for risk reduction factor? So just something to think about when you're looking at um, these kinds of choices with your final elements. Um, um, in conclusion, we need to always go back to that definition of safe state when we're looking at how we select the voting for a given situation. Where we've got the redundant systems we and, and can offer more voting options, we do have the trade-off between risk reduction factor and Mean time to fail spurious. The risk reduction factor is based on dangerous trips. 
Spurious trip is based on safe failures. Um, so we need to do that balance between the two. And typically um, the RRF, as it goes up, the spurious trip will go the opposite direction. So you want to find the balance between the two. Our spurious trip rate is important. We need to define it in our safety requirement specification as to what our target ought to be. But it's kind of a lagging parameter when we're trying to do the design. We need to meet our SIL um, our compliance trilogy first, then we can look at the spurious trip rate and there might be things that we can do to improve that if we still need to without having to affect our primary purpose of meeting risk reduction factor. And then in doing the assessment, um, I always approach these by first getting that safe state definition on target and really understanding what needs to happen to achieve a safe state. Then I identify the subgroups based on their physical system, um, what we need to achieve, individual process streams, and define that voting within the subgroup first. Then the voting between the groups is the last thing that we would look at. So um, that's what I had for you today. Just a quick um, indication, here is the United States, North American, um, to upcoming training. If you're looking for schedule at other areas, you can look to um, exita.com training for additional information. And I'm going to hang on. Don't go away, folks. I'm going to come back and answer the questions here in just a minute. Um, we have a lot of online training courses since most of us are still um, not traveling very much, staying close to home. Here's some online training that we can do while we're at, um, while we are somewhat sequestered. Um, you can find Exida on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Um, also, we like to hear from folks who attend these webinars. You have questions. If you've got something you'd like to hear um, for a particular webinar topic, please send us a note to um, academy at exida.com with that request for topic. And then if you have any particular questions, I'm going to run through what's been put into the system here. But if you have any follow-ups at any point, um, my email, D chestane knight at exeter.com. You can send something directly to me or you can check out um, our website, any of the reference material or the white papers that we have posted at the Exeter website. So now I'm going to turn my attention to the questions list. Um, again, my apologies about the screen. Let me get the slides. Uh, Trying to find the beginning of the actual questions, so bear with me just one second. Okay, why not analyze two sensors instead of three? Um, you certainly could look at doing two sensors instead of three, maybe in a one out of two voting. Um, I just didn't look at that option, so it certainly would be one that you could compare, and you might be able to do two sensors and save a little um, on that and still meet your requirements for risk reduction factor with the um, spurious trip rate that you're hoping for. Um, effectively, that one out of two that I looked at in degraded voting, um, and the two out of two in the degraded voting probably would represent um, exactly what we had for if we only had two sensors. Um, how do we consider, how are we considering the IPL attributes if we are counting for BPCS valve in SIL2? Um, Basically, the, the adjustment that I came back and did and looked at the common cause failure, that's taking into account the fact that we are not fully independent um, in that IPL layer. Um, that valve and the actuator are shared by the BPCS and they are shared by the SIF, the safety, the safety instrumented system. And we have to always make that adjustment to reduce our achieved risk reduction factor, recognizing that there is not full independence between the two. And as I pointed out, the um, standard does allow us to do that. Um, one out of two with FPV means that the BPCS is SIL rated one. No, it does not mean the BPCS is SIL rated. The BPCS um, is, is not SIL rated at all. All it means is that we have one actuator and one valve that both the BPCS and the SIS 
are sharing. That um, does not mean the, the control valve has to be SIL rated in this situation. Um, typically, we want to go with that kind of arrangement with the extra solenoid um, when there's no other physical option in order to um, put in additional redundancy. In the example, use an RRF for SIL 2 equal to 112. I think I actually, um, no, the, what we did is this was based on a, a real world example is actually where I came up with that SIL target for the risk reduction factor. Um, in that particular example, they may have had additional um, risk that needed to be mitigated. So instead of doing the risk reduction factor at 100, which is the lower part of the band, we wanted to make sure that that safety function was actually designed to be farther up in the, the range between 100 and less than 1,000. We wanted it to be positioned up um, where the average was a little farther into that range instead of at the floor. Um, so it really depends on how you do your cell targeting. Um, how that's defined in your functional safety management plan as to whether you have these intermediate risk reduction factors or if you're just assigning to the minimum for the band. Uh, you say the SIF voting is different than logic voting, but isn't it part of the logic voting? The logic voting will also have other pieces like the sensor voting. Yes, the, the sensor, um, how you calculate it in the safety function and how it is looked at in the logic, most often those are going to be the same. Um, in your final elements, there almost always will be additional activities that go on that might be ancillary. And the main difference, you know, the logic is going to tell, for example, in that sulfuric acid stream we were looking at, the logic is going to tell both of those valves to close. Our definition of safe state, we have stopped that flow if either of those valves closed. So we want to make sure that what we do in our verification calculations is reflective of the safe state, not of the desired um, action. Um, in the same example, the calculated RRF is 107. Is it not considered close enough to risk reduction factor of 120 to pass? I think our target risk reduction factor, I'm actually going to go back to it, it's 120, not 112. So no, 107 is less than 120, so it does not meet target. Will there be a way to access the slides later so that we can look at the de uh, closer details? Yes, I understand that the webinar is being recorded. It will be available to you through YouTube, and I believe we send out PDFs of the slides as well. So that will follow up for you. Um, in an example with two XPV, common cause not apply. Correct. If we've got two XPVs and they are wired directly into the safety instrumented systems and that control valve was used strictly by the basic process control, then um, we would have no issues with common cause failure. We would not need to make that adjustment. An example with three out of three or one out of three sensing element, common cause does not apply. Um, that is, in that case, we've got three separate sensors. Um, we might need to make it a common cause adjustment if we've got something like they're all tied to the same nozzle or if they were getting information from the same um, tube, then we might need to. But typically, you want to try and separate those. And then, of course, we have a, a factor we consider in the SIL calculation, a beta factor that looks at the things like the, um, that where there might be some commonality like wiring, um, shared sensors, um, that kind of thing. We can look at the common cause through that beta factor and it actually gets built into that calculation. MTTFS and solenoid example for one out of two was down to 30, 
uh, 35 years, but it's not practically sufficient to have a spurious trip every 35 years. Um, yeah, I mean, when you're talking the spurious trip rates, um, obviously the plant, the manufacturing environment, our least safe time is when we are going through a startup or going through a shutdown. So we want to avoid spurious trips. But in the practical sense um, of operation, is a spurious trip rate of 50 years versus 70 years really that different? Now you're going to go through many shutdowns during that time. You'll be going through turnarounds. So do we really need a spurious trip period um, that long? You know, 35 years is a long time. That's a pretty good, robust number. And um, I think most of us would be happy with that number as being um, spurious trip resistant. Common cause with the BPCS, does that not use the beta factor? Um, no, the, the beta factor is used in building the SIL verification calculation. Uh, we can't put a beta on the, um, the BPCS of influence into the calculation. That's why it has to be done um, off to the side. Uh, what is the safe way to share a valve between both CIS and BPCS for splitting the connection? Um, is there any special device to split the CIS logic solver and the BPCS IO module? Well, obviously, the, the, in this example, I am, we have two logic solvers um, are, are envisioned there. You've got your basic process control that is controlling that valve, and then you've got your safety instrument and system that its entire role is just simply shutting down the system and bringing it to a safe state. So there's two separate logic solvers. And the only thing that is shared in this example is the actuator and the valve itself, the control valve itself. Uh, what is the approach you use when dealing with the calculations on PFD average when there are more multiple SIFs connected to the same PLC considering the CPU failure of the PLC can impact the safety function. Um, the PLC is figured into this calculation, um, the safety logic solver. When we look at this, the, the logic solver is doing that calculation to look at the reliability of the logic solver. Um, so it gets, you know, we have the individual groups, sensor, logic solver, and finer element, and then they work together to get this overall um, SIF logic. And is common cause same as beta factor? Uh, no, it is not. I see we've got some Excellentia users here. That's a good question. And the Excellentia results are um, right here. Is it possible to share your example Excellentia file as reference? Um, this file, I didn't really set it up to share, so there's a lot of junk in it. Um, but if we want to, uh, I may give you a, a call offhand, and I can maybe show a little more information or share a little more to um, individually on this question. So. That's the list of the questions that I had. I really appreciate your attendance this afternoon. Again, I apologize for my delay in getting the screens available to everybody. Um, but if we don't have any additional questions, I thank you for giving us a call. And again, I'm going to run back and show the screen one more time with my email on it and how to get in touch with Exida. Um, at our website where there's a lot more resources for training. So thank you very much for your time this afternoon, and I hope you all have a wonderful day.